My name is Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University in St. Charles, Missouri, and I'd like to welcome you to Insight. Now, Insight is a show where we discuss books uh, generally on politics, domestically, foreign affairs wise, and uh, sometimes historical books provide some insight into the present. Uh, today's book is addressing American military uh, policy. It's written by Elliot Cohen, who's a professor at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And the title of his book is called The Big Stick, The Limits of Soft Power and the Necessity of Military Force. Now, joining me on the show today are three Lindenwood University students. To my immediate right is Jonah Mead Van Court. To Jonah's right is Kyle Kisner. And to Kyle's right is Daniel Gilmore. So I wanted to read an introduction or a uh, statement that the author has in the book to give you a sense where he's coming from, and then we'll jump into a discussion of the book. The uh, author writes, the bottom line here is simple. Despite all the disappointment and losses of recent years, America is immensely strong across many dimensions of power. Yes, the United States has bungled some of its recent operations, but has been immensely successful in others. Yes, other powers are on the rise, and the United States' relative edge is diminishing. But its armed forces are large, competent, and the inheritors of two generations of global military endeavor. Behind America's hard power lies a productive economy. No other country or collection of countries has a better hand to play in international politics. That said, the game to which it brings this hand is changing. In some areas, the United States' military edge is eroding or endangered and needs to be restored or refashioned. Its dominance remains, but has diminished as a result of its competitors' efforts. So, uh, to me, when reading this book, I thought it was going to be a push for soft power over hard power, due to the phrase, the big stick, which was first said by Teddy Roosevelt. The full quote is, speak softly and carry a big stick. I, uh, but this book is, advocates that in order to preserve our values, we need to have a presence in countries that don't follow our values. Correct. His view in this book is essentially that despite whatever criticisms one may have or whatever negatives may have come out of it, and he certainly delves into that, that America is simply the necessary means to the end, the end being not only ensuring our own liberty and values, but sort of the call back to John Quincy Adams saying wherever freedom is threatened, we'll meet that threat. And he also goes in and sort of explains that there's even been instances where that's been thoroughly displayed. Germany in the 30s and 40s, Bosnia Herzegovina in the 90s, and then of course you have various genocides in Africa. His thesis is that the alternative is simply too bad. I initially thought that the book was going to actually be like a satire on excessive military intervention. I thought the big stick was supposed to be like a joking title and the cover of like boots on the ground was like like mocking people being overly hawkish, but it ended up being the case that he doesn't have a problem with the hawkish nature of the American military despite our ever increasing national debt. But uh I found myself disagreeing with a large portion of the book, but I'll give him credit for explaining how the military could still be useful in 2018. Uh, basically, he has four uh, challenges, and he's saying that here's sort of the problems that we have to be aware of, and one is a, a rising military power on the part of China. And then he's talking about the Islamic movement, which he sees as metastasizing, so going in a variety of directions. And then he's concerned about sort of uh, nuclear proliferation, so going to unstable governments. And then finally, he's concerned about sort of he weaves them together, I think, uh, cyberspace and outer space and 
they merge together. So these are sort of his four areas where he's uh, concerned. So the book sort of, I think, uh, a lot of at times, a lot of the effort is focused there to say how do we address these problems. Um, well, I'm just going to go quickly go through those four issues. For, for, for one, uh, for, uh, ch the rising power of China. To, uh, as someone who's been to China, that is very, uh, a very real thing. I think it's a very uh, strong country with a very different view from us. But I don't think that our military ha is, is equipped to deal with that power. I think that soft power will be an alternative. The nuclear deal is also, I don't think that the military can go, can, you can go into a country that has uh, a n nuclear capabilities. I think that, that would be too risky. I think that the Islamic State is is the one thing I think our military could deal with, and uh, that's I think the that's about uh, the only extent where I see our military being a good first solution. I sort of to sort of springboard off of what Jonah just said. Believe that he's laying these out as issues that need to be addressed, and that his personal view is that America needs to act as the check and balance to those rising factions. If China rises up, there's a lot of unknown variances be with the Chinese government and military that we don't necessarily know in terms of their defense spending. He goes into that a little bit that we don't necessarily know because how they account for that isn't necessarily the same as how we account for that here. Is rhyme, the rise in Islamist movements is really a response in many ways to American uh, foreign policy. As uh, Then you also have the rise in nuclear states and things like that is sort of all plays into the same ball of wax. Yeah, yeah um, the idea of a check on China, that's uh, something that I think is a point he's trying to get across. And when I read the section on him uh, questioning how you determine exact Chinese defense spending. One of the things I was aware of was back when the Soviet Union was the Soviet Union, uh, so prior to it falling apart and becoming just Russia, that uh, that was a major issue that was constantly a focus of a lot of American military studies is how much are the Russians or Soviets really spending on military spending, and we had difficulty trying to figure out an accounting process for that. So the idea of finding we're doing that with China now, that seems to me like a repeat of that. I believe that, there would, that it's unnecessary to try to counter China's action by building up our own military. I feel that trying to seek peace with them and making a treaty such as the Iran deal would probably be the best strategy in that regard. It, it would certainly save the most amount of money. Um, well, I, one thing that I uh, thought about when I'm talk, reading about China here is I, I thought about what I learned in history class about the Roman Empire and how it, it stretched its arm too far, far to try to take over too much of the world. And because of that, it couldn't focus back on home, which is what I see here. I see America not focusing on, like, on uh, helping their own citizens and more reaching and reaching to try to control more areas and the Roman Empire essentially crumbled because of that. I don't want to see the same thing happen to America because we're reaching too far. Yeah, I mean we have uh, military bases in like every country in the world that's arguably an empire. So. Um, he has a whole section in the front of the book there addressing sort of how I wouldn't call them critics, he sort of calls them schools of thought so that you're having sort of the notion of uh, the realists and the realists believe in military power, but he's saying they have limitations because they're not seeming to use enough imagination, basically, uh, or the idea that uh, the isolationist approach, obviously he's not going to be supportive of anything such as this. And so he has these different schools of thought, which he says uh, are all having limitations on how you perceive of what should America's role be. Uh, yeah, and I, I look at soft power when you say that, and I see that as how we should not be isolationists. We should be trading with countries our enemies in order to, if we want to change the way they think by changing their culture through, by selling them movies that push our views, by, by selling them books that push our views, by, by just having a soft presence. But we, I don't think that having a, a big gun to their, over their country is going to actually have a good long-term effect and it's eventually going to fail in one of these countries. 
That's, that, I mean, that's what I think. However, does he not state in here, though, that uh, even many of the soft power advocates will admit that soft power is limited only by a country's propensity or ability to conduct hard power when and where it needs to and on precision on command. So soft power has its limits. And while Jonah laid out various versions of soft power that are much more appealing, there are other aspects of soft power that aren't so appealing, such as sanctions, such as embargoes, blockades, things of well, that nature. Well, this is what he's saying is basic. His concept of soft power is that you have an embargo or a sanction right. or you somehow marshal public opinion. Uh, I don't think he's saying those aren't needed or can't be used. I think he's perceiving them, though, as you can't expect them to completely replace military power so that you sort of would do a complement, the two together. I feel that even that soft power would be going too far. I feel that Switzerland is a good example of how the world should respond and that sanctions and tariffs and whatnot, all that's just going to escalate tensions just more slowly. And uh, he points out that, it's, uh, that it won't work, but we have a different view on why it won't work, it's actually. Well, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's saying that, but I, I don't think he's really saying you shouldn't try. Uh, sanctions, for example, he goes through a whole section here on that sanctions might be tried, but they're not going to maybe necessarily have the impact we want. But then, uh, so now you are going to have some military power to back up your failure at using soft power options, but then you still have to make that leap to say, am I really sending in military forces? I have a chicken and the egg problem when I'm talking about, thinking about soft power, because a lot of the times we'll put a sanction on a country and thereby hurt their economy, make their, weaken their government, weaken the social con uh, constraints and programs to protect the citizens and keep them happy. And then we use that justification to go in and try to reform their government, even if we are, through our own sanctions, we put them where they are to begin with. Like this has happened in South America. Um, this is probably going to happen, I'm guessing, in Iran going forward. It's a guess. It's not a, it's not a, I don't know that for sure, but I'm, I think it's going to happen. So we need to make sure that we're not causing the, through soft power the reason that we need to go in and use hard power. He actually, the, Jonah makes a good point there. Cohen even states a quote actually from the book. He says that the U.S. cannot insulate itself from the world disorder for many reasons, and not the least because in some measure it is necessarily the cause of it. And he sort of elaborates on that, that our ideas of equality, uh, political, uh, what's right, including rights for women and things of that nature, aren't necessarily viewed as good things in a lot of parts of the world, even though we view them as being uh, moral standards above all else. I thought that part of the book was probably his weakest argument. I think the idea that liberal democracy and freedom is something that is unknown in most of the world and that only American troops can bring it to a country, I think that's just post 9-11 nonsense. He's got an interesting quote. He says, the United States cannot insulate itself from world disorder for many reasons, and not least because in some measure it is necessarily a cause of it. Well, it seems to me that it assumes that we are good at bringing virtues through our military to these countries that might, might lose these said values. So, I mean, I guess we were able to rebuild uh, North, uh, Japan after, and we were successful there, but a lot of the time we look at places like Iran where they had a democratic uh, elected leader and we just ended up partnering with, M with our uh, CIA and partnering with MI6 and going in and destabling their government, taking out their elected leader, and now they're, they've gone backwards. It seems like they're now farther away from the values that we say to uphold. So I don't understand. I don't see the. I, I, I fail to see the where the assumptions coming from that we're good at instilling our values in other countries. He had well continue with this quote. He says, uh, "American beliefs about political equality, rights to include rights of women, religious freedom, and civil liberties, including the right to property, are a menace in many places, often without America's knowing or wishing it." 
which is sort of interesting that uh, people just perceive us as having a threat to them because of the way we're living. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, the, the, he definitely has a point with that. And I don't think you can look at any military campaign we've conducted over the past hundred years. And he, he certainly delves into a lot of them uh, and say that everything was positive. There was definitely some negatives that came out of our involvement in the Middle East. There's definitely been negatives, even negatives that came out of our involvement in World War II, believe it or not, that still having effects in the world today. Uh, often, much of the time, not necessarily for the better. The, uh, so he's got another section where essentially he's talking about what I'd say is the legacy of Vietnam. And he seems like it has a very long shadow and it's sort of still continuing. And so there's some adjustments that are being made uh, to this and he's citing changes in uh, U.S. Army field manuals. I know I, I wrote a piece about that uh, some time ago. and. So that was a big change that you're trying to now address different types of counterinsurgency warfare uh, as a result of that field manual change that came about in 2006. Then the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I think, accepted it in 2009. So uh, as a result, and he refers to these in the book, so that there's some changes, but that he still sees sort of a legacy from Vietnam sort of uh, overshadowing a lot of what the United States does. Yeah, he, he cites the Gulf War in 1990 as an example of how he thinks war should go, that it should be swift and, cl and swift and clean and brutal, but that it should quickly end and not drag on like Vietnam did or our current wars have. Uh, I, like, also, a lot of the time when we wage war, we don't, literally go in as a U.S. Army. We most of the time w w wage these proxy wars that seem to d just c continually start before they finish, like new ones start before they finish, and it's just this endless cycle. It's the opposite of the Gulf War in a lot of situations. It's just like endless grinding war for, I don't, I, I don't see the, the virtue coming out of it. I don't see us getting anything socially out of that. Well, we really do see emerging, though, of these tactics. It's interesting that he does get to delve into the coin strategy and the evolving tactics. And during a period that I actually served in the military, we went through basic combat training. Much of our training was actually centered. It was based out of what they're teaching people in Vietnam. He actually takes that even further and says much of the uh, counter-military or the uh, conventional military tactics go all the way back to World War II, and he's correct in that. I was in Iraq when General Petraeus was serving, I actually met him many times, and when coin strategy was being implemented, and then that eventually evolves into the increased focus on unmanned drone strikes and special operations using more of the sort of hard counterinsurgency that he talks about, and sort of a contrast to hard power, soft power, versus the hearts and minds approach that you saw much of in Vietnam. That's true. In our, in our current wars, we, we don't use any of those tactics from World War II or Vietnam. They're almost exclusively drone strikes now, so I don't know if I would call it a proxy war, but it's certainly a war that doesn't involve a large, like, manpower. He had an interesting quote. I just want to read it. Behind the intent to overthrow the Saddam uh, Hussein regime was a desire not so much to remake the Arab world altogether, but to inflict a blow that would shock it. And yet, when uh, the Bush administration went to war, they sort of did so almost on a premise that by overthrowing Saddam Hussein, you were bringing some sort of democracy. And this here is sort of in contrast with sort of, let's say, the uh, image of the propaganda or image that the Bush administration put forth. Well, he talks about how things in Iraq weren't really they didn't just suddenly start, they didn't stop in 91 and then start again yeah. in 03. It was a continuous, there was continuous tension, there were sanctions, no fly zones, all that going on with Saddam Hussein and the concept of the fake weapons of mass destruction was actually just bad intel because they, Saddam Hussein's regime had not been very transparent in terms of their programs that they were in fact dormant. 
So 2003 wasn't just a response as we need to win a decisive victory against a conventional military. It was also just an outgrowth of this continued aggression with Iraq. Hmm. I uh, have a, my, my, my uh, father has a girlfriend that's from uh, Syria and not Syria, um, Iran, sorry. And uh, she says that when she was growing up, the culture there was you could wear jeans, you could wear, you didn't have to wear the hijab. But then after um, the intervention... After the Shah was overthrown? It actually went backwards. They actually reverted to an earlier state. And that brings me to this quote that comes early in the book. It says, all of society fails, when all of society fails, religion remains. And when you go into a country, you weaken, uh, you, you break down the social order, and, but religion remains. And religion is from a, a, a time that's o older. And older times bring conservative values back. So I, and conservative values aren't the same values that we value in the United States. I mean, in, in, that, in, the, in, this, in this sense. I mean, there are some conservative values we do have here, but ha women not being able to show their face and being seen as property is probably not a value that I would say that we're trying to instill in other countries. But uh, I would say to that that uh, that's not exactly how the Iranian Revolution went. Uh, there was widespread support around Ayatollah Khomeini, and the Iranian people knew what they would be getting into, a theocracy by overthrowing the Shah, but the Shah was just that despised that the revolution in 79 happened. It wasn't, religion didn't like end up dominating the country because of like a vacuum. It was, it was planned out that way. The, um aspects of the book talk about how the United States is successfully adapted uh, so that uh, he goes through sort of the notion of he's looking at Iraq and Afghanistan and then sort of saying well the United States sort of did do a fairly good job adapting to fight in these situations. Sure that you have some problems initially but he's sort of focusing on you're not staying locked in you're making changes uh, and so then he's going through sort of some of these changes which he addresses as counterinsurgency warfare. I don't see how we could say that we were at all successful in, count in Iraq, besides, I guess you could say, killing Saddam Hussein. Like, we went in there twice, and we have left the country in a much... Uh, lower, like the society much lower than it was when we went in there, and we also went in there with evidence that was uh, it was faulty. It was it was evidence that was used uh, 20 years ago, put away, and then brought back out when we wanted to go in the second time. We can't be going into pl places with evidence that has already been addressed. That doesn't that, that isn't how. Uh, we should be operating our, 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 our stick. Right. He, ta he talks about that a lot, but then again, excuse me, <laughs> he looks at these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and he sees a lot of success and a lot of it really does depend on how you actually measure success. Yes, we went in there and won decisive mm -hmm. military victories, and our body counts were comparatively low to conflicts in the past. However, we didn't have a plan, as is the Department of Defense, did not have a plan for setting up government and infrastructure following all of that. They basically annihilate the entire infrastructure of Iraq, or rather, as they say, and he mentions in the book, they say, let it fall, you know, they kind of let it just do itself in. But now there was high rates of unemployment and the economy was very bad and people weren't able to get basic things like clean water. So that drives up the frustration. And as Jonah said, a lot of them were turning increasingly to religion and the sectarian differences became to the forefront. Yeah, but like he mentions, the. <clears throat> The military had no real plan of what to do when the I Iraqi government was gone, and as a result, and the military was relatively, I don't know if I want to say undisciplined, but certainly didn't know how to behave in such a situation. And he illustrates that by describing the Abu Ghraib prison incident, where members of the army were just torturing. 
prisoners for no reason and were photographed doing so as a means of showing that America doesn't, didn't know what it was doing when it was initially arrived in Iraq? Well, and um, I, I think that's what he's trying to address was that that's not real military power. They somehow should have had different elements come in to do the administration. He sort of uh, refers to that, but isn't quite sure, well, how do you then suddenly pull the military out and then put a civilian leadership in? Uh, but uh, we sort of did it uh, with a guy named Bremer, and he did it poorly. Uh, but uh, as a result, this is what he's trying to address is sort of some of these adaptations. And so when he's saying success and failures, he's sort of seeing both at the same time. Um, we only have a few minutes left. What do you think of this book? I think it's a book that should be read. I think that this book is gives you a perspective that you should have because it is held by a lot of people in power and because of that for, for no other reason you should know about how other people are thinking the thing that the premise that you need to uh, accept in order to believe this book is that we is that we are not moving towards a more peaceful society we are moving towards a more violent society and therefore we need our religion or our military sorry I I agree largely with his thesis personally that there needs to be a balance and approach that you can't necessarily achieve. He really does talk about that very pretty uh, candidly, saying that no one advocate group of soft power or realists or so on and so forth really have the whole correct picture. Uh, having said that, I don't necessarily agree with how he necessarily comes to that thesis, some of the things he looks at in terms of viewing the, he talks about the weight of blood and treasure in military campaigns, he talks about the psychological stress on militaries and he says, well, there's no way to measure that. Where, well, there in fact is ways to measure that. But all in all, I would definitely recommend this book as, as kind of giving a good balanced view on why it is we can't just suddenly drop arms, as counterintuitive as it seems, continued aggression doesn't necessarily lead to peace, but we can't just immediately just say, okay, we're going to fold our deck in right off the bat. I feel that the book did a good job of showing what the modern threats are, such as China and the Islamic State, and he doesn't go into it much, but presumably Russia. However, I disagree thoroughly with his thesis. I I feel Switzerland is the model of the, of the world for foreign power and that the United States military should be concerned in America. The, our largest military in the world is no doubt a burden on the taxpayers, so I found the book frustrating in a lot of ways how militaristic Cohen intended to be. Uh, well, okay. A um, couple of different points of view. I like the book, uh, and it takes you a little while to chug through it, but in the end, I think you'll get something out of it. Thank you for joining us.